please be reminded to keep your microphone muted during the presentation of today. So in order to start today's seminar, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Brian Goberts, Director of International Mason Quit Improvement Center, CIMIT, for a welcome message. Dr. Goberts, the floor is yours. Thanks, Isabel, and as always, uh, well-organized. Thanks. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining the seminar. A very interesting plant breeding for resistance to insects, how sensor technology and artificial intelligence contribute to sustainable crop production, and, and it does fit on the slide. So this is our first uh, seminar for 2022. On behalf of the CIMIT scientific community, I'm, I'm very honored and, and wish to welcome our special speaker today, which is Dr. Lucas uh, Noldes, founder and CEO, CEO of Noldes Information Technology. Uh, who uh, will be introduced by the one and only RAF's uh, director, Martin. So very happy also to have Martin uh, here uh, with us. Thanks, Martin. We know you have a very, very busy schedule with the initiative. So thanks for carving out time uh, to, to further introduce uh, Lucas. Uh, I think Lucas is, uh, is also an example of combining. You can see two logos, uh, university with, with being CEO uh, of a company. So we are very intrigued. Uh, also to hear more about that. And of course, we have Prasanna, CIMIT Global uh, MIS Program Director, but also um, uh, lately very, very busy as leader of the 1CGIR Plant Health uh, Initiative, uh, bringing several things together. So Prasanna, uh, we're also looking forward for, for you to give the context uh, of, this, uh, of this seminar. So, so thanks everybody for being here uh, and, uh, and the floor is yours, Martin, to give uh, an introduction to the rest uh, of the seminar. Once again, thanks. Thank you. And the Martin, you are muted. Here, you Martin, you are muted. Yeah, that's the most uh, expressed sentence in the last year, two years, right? You're muted. Um, so, but uh, no, I, Lucas and I did, I think, the, our PhD at the same time, more or less, in marketing. And uh, Lucas was one of the few people in those days who started bringing scientific results, I think his thesis work, into a business. And not many people in those days started their businesses. And um, so step by step, he uh, built up a company that is super successful. Many people thought in those days, is this going to work? Because, you know, he, he developed software, if I remember well, to uh, observe insects, because he's an entomologist. And in insects, you need software to be able to observe them, not only by writing things down. So he started developing those. And uh, then he brought that technology step by step into a very successful company. He has one of the most beautiful buildings in Wageningen uh, with his name on it. And uh, so all of the university is always uh, going to be proud on uh, Lucas as well, because I think this is also showing how science can go for impact and then go beyond. Uh, so basically the behavioral research for insects, that's where it started. But um, what I heard several times when we met again, uh, Lucas, uh, I heard then he started with Boeing, uh, engineering, uh, all kinds of biometric analysis and the sensor technology. And at Simit, we are doing things as well. But um, uh, as far as I don't know, I don't know if we use uh, in the CG much of your applications, but your applications, Lucas, are now going way beyond uh, in entomology, right? Um, but for Lucas, uh, we have now uh, in the new CGIR, we will be organized in three units, uh, system transformation, which is mere policy and governance, uh, resilient agri-food systems research, uh, that's where plant health research is in there, and I'm leading that globally. And then we have genetic innovation. So, and um, the future is also that the science is organized not anymore across the centers, but uh, across those three units. And step by step, we bring it up. But what people don't know, because Lucas is very, uh, a very modest person as I know him. So, but he built up a company in, uh, I think now, 23 offices in uh, 10 countries and with 160 employees. And these are high tech people. And it's, of course, the, the, those best people working on the software and on modeling, um, they are going to the best teams. And for him, it's always relatively easy to get people. And uh, so he built up a very nice company, um, uh, successful. He's still looking for people, he mentions all the time. So um, I think for us also as CGIR, and that's also, uh, Lucas, you're not now just with uh, the um, CIMIT, but also um, uh, entomologists and so on, or plant, uh, plants, uh, science, health scientists uh, across the CGIR. 
So, but, and I think there's really a lot of opportunities to uh, work together in that sense. So thanks Lucas for being with us. Um, uh, it's virtual, uh, but um, uh, we look all forward to your presentation. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bram and Martin, for that excellent introduction. Uh, I think, uh, Martin, hearing from you uh, the way in which uh, Lucas established this strong, uh, uh, what we call conduit for research to move into technologies and to business is something very fascinating. And I'm sure that colleagues will learn a lot from this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, friends, uh, I don't need to introduce the topic so much, but we all know that robust and resilient agri-food systems require indeed uh, healthy crops, and healthy crops are indeed vital for ensuring the food security and livelihoods of millions of resource-constrained uh, smallholder farmers uh, for whom we work in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, undoubtedly, host plant resistance is the key pillar in, in the integrated pest management. And the breeding for host plant resistance is, especially for insect pests, uh, is a challenging task. Simit uh, has been at this uh, since last uh, four to five decades in both peat and maize. And uh, uh, earlier scientists like John Mim devoted their lifetime uh, in terms of breeding for insect resistance in crops like maize. And there's, those efforts are not in vain, Lucas, that uh, Simit's uh, earlier scientists work on exploiting the taxpenos and the Caribbean germplasm in developing uh, stem borer resistant and fala mewam resistant materials are now coming to very good use uh, in our efforts in Africa uh, to develop and uh, deploy elite fala mewam tolerant hybrids. Uh, three such hybrids we have already developed and released uh, to the companies as well as to the national partners for their uh, nomination to the national performance trial. So in 2022, we expect uh, Africa to release the Fala Miwam tolerant conventional uh, resistant hybrids. Um, but at the same time, we do recognize that phenotyping is a, is a major challenge. It is, a time, it is time intensive, cost intensive, labor intensive. And uh, this is where we look forward to your uh, webinar uh, on how the sensor technology and the artificial intelligence can help in uh, effective and robust phenotyping for insect pests. Of course, your target pests are different, the thrips, aphids, uh, the sucking pests, uh, are, but I'm sure that there'll be something to learn and to apply for on, on those uh, particular plant health threats that we are working on. Uh, so overall, thanks a lot. This is a great opportunity for us uh, to hear from a very experienced uh, uh, scientist with the novel ways of working. And the public-private consortium that you have established in taking forward this is something that uh, we are eagerly looking forward to, to listen. Uh, thanks a lot, Lucas, once again for visiting CIMIT and for uh, giving our scientists an opportunity to understand the things that you are working on. Uh, so. The, the platform is yours now, uh, Lucas. Thank you very much. With so many kind introductions, I'm really, really honored. Uh, and I hope I'm not going to disappoint you with so many nice words. You can always hardly you only fail because the expectations may be so high. Now, let's get started. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of visiting Simit in November last year and get a, a great tour in Mexico, Mexico City, great tour of the facilities, the labs and the test fields. And uh, so I got a really nice impression of, of the, what's going on there. I didn't meet the, the say the key management and the old, many scientists because many people work from home. So I hope to come back one day. And I also look forward to visiting other CIMIT sites in the world where fascinating research is going on especially where the entomology research is going on, because that's where my special interest lies. Now, without further ado, I'm going to start my presentation. The title has already been mentioned. It is about insects, it's about plant breeding and resistance, and it is in particular about insect behavior. Uh, the, the introductions have already told you who I am. Uh, my background is in biology. I did my PhD in Wageningen in entomology and I started my company. Uh, another side activity of mine is being professor at uh, the university in Nijmegen, uh, not in Wageningen, but in Nijmegen, 30 kilometers further down the road in biophysics, uh, which is a, a very much a, a Nijmegen 
uh, department in the physical in the physical sciences, um, which is a great source of inspiration for things I can use for agricultural research tools. And I have a small appointment at Wageningen University as well in the Department of Human Behavior. And I'm active in uh, many other many committees. And I mentioned this one, Netherlands Academy of Technology and Innovation, because Martin is also a member. And with our academy meetings, we always hope that they coincide with a visit of Martin, Martin to the Netherlands. But those have also been online in the past two years. So the, there are no currently geographical barriers to participation. So my, my company that has already been around for 30 years, develops tools for the measurement of behavior. And our goal is to promote the human and animal health and well-being based on data collected from behavior by developing intelligent tools, software tools, hardware instruments, and that which help our customers to develop innovative products and services, which contribute to sustainable development and quality of life. And those customers are scientists, scientists working in universities and research departments all around the world, using those tools to do their research. Uh, we, we are headquartered in Wageningen. This is a small picture of our building. And our, you find our customers around the world. In mostly universities, about 80% of our business go to universities and research institutes, including one CGIAR IAR institute, the ERI in the Philippines. Um, and we hope more others will follow in the future. The research departments of companies like plant breeding companies, nutrition companies, farming companies, and also pharmaceuticals, food retail. Uh, we are indeed a multinational company. Uh, we have some unique 23 offices over spread over 10 countries, headquartered in the Netherlands, brand, main branch office in the US, main branch in China, and business partners in other countries. You see here Malaysia, India, Australia, uh, Japan, Korea, Brazil, which help our customers locally. Now, the, the focus of today is on helping farming systems to become more sustainable and more productive in order to contribute to one of the sustainable development goals, which is this one here, zero hunger for all inhabitants of our planet. Um, the the plant-based food is one of the main sources to feed the human population. And plant-based resources, plants, crops are always being threatened by uh, by factors, both biotic and abiotic factors. The main impact factors are listed here, and insects are one of them, an important factor in the impacting crops grown around the world. That includes aphids, thrips, and bugs, leafhoppers, and whiteflies, and many others. The first focus of my talk will be on sucking insects, but the applications of the, the technology I'm presenting are much wider. They also include um, uh, biting and scraping insects and boring insects and uh, caterpillars and uh, many others. Um, the, the traditional way in which insects pests are controlled uh, is, no, sorry, the first damage caused by sucking insects includes a variety of damage patterns, such as damage to the tissue, the virus transmission, very important, uh, through flowing uh, and cosmetic damage making uh, fruits and vegetables unsellable, even though the nutritional uh, component contents may be perfect. Here we see a leaf full of uh, whiteflies of uh, various stages. Um, traditionally, or conventionally, insect pests are controlled with insecticides. However, incre in, uh, increasingly, governments, especially in, Euro in Europe, but uh, anywhere else, are banning certain categories of insecticides forcing scientists to come up with more sustainable solutions. And one of these is breeding for resistance, resistance to insects um, in which the, say the, uh, the information from nature is brought into a plant uh, leading to a, a genotype that has a, pheno a resistant phenotype. And the res researchers uh, active in plant breeding, the, do this by phenotypic screening of many plant accessions, say the, the bread varieties or breeding lines, looking for uh, genes and markers that indicate resistance against pest insects, unravel the bio biological basis, and then try to breed a resistant variety. 
Once they've done so, they must establish if the resistance has been achieved. And conventionally, that means um, uh, assessing the plant damage, looking at the plants, looking at the quality, counting offspring and survival of insects, measuring the development time of the insects, and that's all done by humans, by human hands, by human eyes. Like you see this team here, a, a screening team in a breeding, it's a plant breeding department. But that's of course a very time consuming activity. It's labor intensive, costly. It is subjective, imprecise. All the typical drawbacks of human-based data collection are there. Um, for years, the scientists have been uh, dreaming of an automated solution which has never been trivial. Well, years ago, and this is already over seven years ago, a team within Wageningen University approached uh, my company plus a number of plant breeding companies listed here. Uh, the Syngenta, Bayer, uh, Nunems, now part of Bayer, Von Zanten, an uh, ornamental flower breeder, East West Seed, a Dutch Filipinian company, uh, to team up to develop new technology and to validate new technology for automated high throughput screening of insect behavior of plants in order to assess the resistant properties of these plants. Um, we decided to use a technology called uh, video tracking as the basis for our measurements. And that works as follows. We point a video camera on a leaf surface on which an insect, in this case a thrips, is present. And the video camera, uh, the, the computer vision software separates the insect from the background and obtains an object, a digitized object. And from this object, we determine the mathematically the center of body mass. And if we do that 90 times per second for every video frame, we obtain a track, a track of points, which can be connected by lines, and then they form a movement trajectory. Uh, that needs to be uh, the cleaned or smooth in order to remove outliers. And then we obtain a smooth track that approaches the true movement pattern of the insect. Based on that track, we can compute all sorts of per parameters, such as the movement velocity by dividing the distance by time. And that leads to a graph of velocity changing over time. Based on this velocity graph, we can distinguish between periods in which the animal was moving when there was a significant velocity, when it was not moving, low velocity, and periods in which were in between a start and stop velocity threshold. So by thresholding, we can uh, classify this graph into three simple categories, moving, not moving, and undefined. Now, that's, this, is, this is the starting point. A very simple uh, classification of uh, video-based parameters of distance, velocity, and other uh, parameters, turning angle or meander. But eventually, what we, we are not interested in these uh, metrics. We are interested in what the animal is doing uh, to the plant, and whether it is sticking its mouth parts inside the plant, and whether it's actually consuming or ingesting phloem sap, whether it's feeding. Now, now the, the challenge was, how can we derive feeding behavior categories from movement parameters. Then let's take a look at a, uh, what the, the camera sees from above. Here we see an aphid on a leaf. And what the camera sees is the aphid from above. So we see the aphid, we don't see the mouth parts of the aphid or we don't see the mouth parts inside the leaf. All we see is the body, the body motion, the movement, we see the legs, we see antennae, but we don't know exactly what's happening underneath. But based on this velocity graph, we can uh, derive certain patterns inside the, the movement changes over time and relate to those two phases in the feeding behavior and, and distinguish between moving and not moving and probing and not probing by looking at the different categories of body motion and, uh, and translational movements um, and specific uh, movement peaks, which indicate certain patterns in the behavior. So um, in order to find out what, the, what is really happening on the plant and what the, our video tracking software could make of it, we made dual observations. So we pointed one camera down at the plant 
This is what the video tracking system sees. And we point another camera sideways so that we can get a close-up view of the, the movements of the mouth parts and the, the, say the, the details of the body and the head. And we use this in order to validate the algorithms that we use to process the video images. And that is shown in this little video clip. So here we see uh, AFID probing behavior and the top line uh, indicates the, what the human observer sees. The, it's called scored with the observer. So the human observer scores the behavior as probing or not probing. And this is ether vision graph is what the computer vision system has made of it based on these velocity metrics like distance moved and velocity. And we start working on an algorithm that would process these velocity changes and translate that into a behavioral state. And the, we need to tweak that algorithm until the observed classification, uh, say the computer classification equals the human-based scoring. Uh, you see there's still a small discrepancy. The smaller the discrepancy, the, the more accurate our model is. So this is the approach we take in this, uh, this type of measurements uh, until we have a highly reliable recognition of uh, feeding behavior patterns for a specific animal uh, insect species, like in this case, the aphid. Um, but probing is not the same as e feeding. Probing is the first phase of uh, insertion of the stylet into the, the, um, into the leaf surface when the, the, the stylet, of which we can only see this part, this part is inside the leaf surface. This is a transversal section of the leaf. And when, we, uh, when the leaf the stylet is searching for the flowing vessels, once the flowing vessels have been reached, then the probing activity lasts much longer. And uh, experimental studies, different studies have uh, shown that these short probes, this phase lasts only three minutes, and the long probes, lower than 25 minutes, indicate true ingestion of flowing saps. And that's where the virus transmission occurs. That's when the real leaf damage occurs. So that's what we are looking for. And that's also what we try to prevent from happening in resistant varieties. Now, this, this fundamental knowledge comes from other research in which uh, the researchers have used the electrical penetration graph technique in order to measure the resistance, the electrical resistance or conductance between an insect and the ground uh, during different phases of the feeding behavior. Um, and with, by doing this, they've uh, established that uh, resistant cultivars, so the R here, the R bars, have much longer a more a higher, uh, more time spent on non-probing, whereas the once the animal starts probing, it terminates probing faster. Uh, it spends more time, oh, sorry, on long, short probes, whereas the on the susceptible variety, uh, the probes are much longer and real feeding occurs. So this long bar of long probes, high bar of long probes indicate true ingestion and the uh, higher bar of short probes indicates uh, confirms resistance. Now, um, this, well, with this EPG technique, we, you can really ascertain that the stylets have hit the phloem because then that is when the, uh, the conductance goes up or the electrical resistance goes down. Now, and there is a strong correlation between what the, uh, the humans observe and what the video tracking concerned uh, confirmed, and that correlates to the, the real resistance confirmed by electrical penetration graph technique. Now, um, this confirmed to us that, that finding these uh, long probes, the feeding events, was indeed what we needed to go after. After confirming this in one arena, we started scaling up. So we um, built an arena with the um, multiple uh, say, sorry, in an array of arenas. Each circle here is an arena. And we took a high resolution video camera that can oversee all these arenas. Every one is a little well in which a leaf cutting was placed. 
So this is a leaf disc taken out of a leaf. I'll get back to why we did that later. So then what the video camera sees is a number of these green circles on which insects are released. And then next the computer vision software uh, turns the, those, that information into tracks. So here we see a track of an aphid in one of the arenas. The one, this animal here has not moved. This one has been moving. Here we see little, no movement, longer track and so forth. Um, so if we take an image or a computer screen movie of a series of these trials, here we see 20 arenas uh, in which the, these animals observed over a single video camera. This was the initial um, version of this software with the then current uh, existing video resolution. In the, over the years, we have scaled up and scaled up and we can now run 300 essays in parallel with using a single video camera. So with today's video resolution and the computer vision software, that has become possible. Now, now let's um, uh, take a few examples of say re results that have been achieved. Here we have a uh, the Lactuca say lettuce um, the variety where we compared a uh, the the resistant variety, which is Corbana with the susceptible and lead on the susceptible. The, the long probes were much more stay frequent and the total last the duration spent on long probes compared to Corbana. And as also over time, the, the, there was much more percent time spent on long probes using on the Terlana compared with Corbana. And there's over, even over after eight hours, the difference was still visible. And uh, we, we did the same with a model organism, model plant Arabidopsis. So not a commercial crop, but more a research crop of which the, the genome has been mapped very uh, uh, thoroughly with mesospersis and another a and aphid. And, and that there we too saw long probes more frequent and more longer lasting on the susceptible variety compared to a resistant variety. The, the uh, effect is less stronger with lettuce but the, the, the differences are clear most of the time and significant in several instances. Then, but now I told you we use leaf disc. A leaf disc is not a complete leaf. And you may wonder, um, doesn't that impact the, the, the phenomenon, the resistance related phenomenon that you're studying? So the EEG sh shows, um, we, can, we can compare EEG uh, effects on complete graphs as well as leaf discs and then see, does the same effect, the resistant effect occur on a complete plant, an intact plant or on a leaf disc? Now, and we found that the effect is strongest on the complete plant, uh, less on the leaf disc, but still in most cases, the, the susceptible is higher and significant after eight hours, but the effect is attenuated. It is detectable, but we need more samples uh, and not the, the power is the, not that strong. Uh, so if we make a say halfway summing up, we, we found that video tracking is um, more attractive than this classical labor intensive EPG technique um, the, because it's fully automated. We, with EPG, yes, we can get one animal tested in 15 minutes. In with video tracking, we can do it uh, fully automated, less preparation time. Um, and currently, at that time, we could do 100. Now we can do 300 fully automated, but they're still leaf discs. So um, let's, uh, we will, I will elaborate on two aspects. So one is how can we go from leaf disc to intact plant, but also how can we offer the insect a choice? But so far I've shown you what happens if an insect is simply placed on a surface and it has no choice to go anywhere. So we, all we can see is, how much it eats, how much it probes, and whether it walks or not. Uh, but it's more interesting if we give the insect a choice, but uh, we're allowing it to choose between two leaves. And that requires some engineering to create a sort of a T, what we call a T maze, a, a, T, a two choice setup in which the insect can choose. Now, in order to multiply that to scale up, we had to make that T maze vertical. So what you are now seeing is a, a, a section, transversal section through the T maze in which the animal is 
initially placed in a release compartment. And then once this plate is moved to the left, the opening becomes accessible, the animal can crawl up and then here make a choice to go right or left. So it will crawl along this uh, cylinder and walk and can crawl over the, over the ceiling and then go back and forth and spend more or less time in either of these two leaf discs. Uh, so here the plate is open, animal walks up and makes a choice. And this has become a very robust and uh, scalable solution. So here we see one arena transversal. Here you see a top view. Each of these couples, green, gray, green, is one arena with two zones. So this is one, one test arena and this has been replicated over this plate. Um, and the higher the resolution of the camera, the smaller the, we can make the arenas. And we eventually we build up a stack of plates with a re a release compartments, arenas, light units, and even a top glass section that is heated to prevent condensation. And that then becomes something like this, all for the video camera, uh, for the software. So the software sees these arenas, one leaf here. Uh, sorry, let's look at, yeah, a leaf, release tube and a leaf. This is total one arena. Um, and the, the hashed patterns are the arena, the zone indications that the software places on top of the video image. So here we see 55 uh, assays, dual choice, each consisting of two disks and a release compartment in the middle. And during the video tracking, it will look like this. So then we, again, we see arenas here. We see an insect. This is the insect on the left. This one is still in the release compartment. Uh, this one is on the left and this one is on the right. It's walking around the edge here. And then we can do computations on what the data collected. Um, and if we apply this technique, then the animals can allow, we allow the animals the choice between a resistance and susceptible. Then we see indeed that the resistance uh, line is avoided because much more time is spent in the uh, susceptible uh, uh, the compartment um, where there is um, the movement time is about equal, but the duration not moving is higher here because in total more time is spent here. Um, so the, this is the uh, shows clearly the difference uh, of a, a, a or the effect of this technique and differences found within a day after uh, compared to the conventional six days that the classical manual methods last. So there's also a very sensitive technique, but we are still we're dealing with those leaf discs and that was a matter of concern. So we thought, how can we uh, use this method with complete leaves? Um, and for that, we make a special arena plates of, of foam that we can place over intact leaves and then create multiple arenas on the same leaf. Of course, statistically, that has a different meaning because these are arenas made out of the same, um, the same variety, the, the same leaf. But we can also use this technique to create uh, choice situations in which strips of leaves are placed side by side and um, the animal can, the insect can choose from one variety or the other. Now here is um, an example that is close to your business, the maze, uh, which uh, an aphid was released on maize, uh, tracked in eight, uh, for eight hours. And we see lots of differences in behavior on different leaf strips. And these leaf strips can be placed side by side. Uh, they can be replicas of the same variety or they can be different accessions, different breeding lines in under one plate. And here we see video tracking in progress in which the insect is uh, walking, right? This one is walking here, this one is walking. And to say non-movement is usually a sign of the insect actively probing or feeding and the animal walking around being restless. It is searching for a spot to eat and it doesn't find it because it doesn't like it. That's the, the, usually the interpretation of these movement patterns. And, and then the next step was to make this, to make this a research prototype into something that others can use. 
And then we created what we call the Entolab system. So Entolab is this chamber with standardized illumination, illumination here from the side or from the below, depending on the plant species. If the plant tissue is very thin, we can send the light through the leaf. If the plant is very thick, we play, uh, provide light from above. Here is a Fresnel lens, which turns the, uh, the, 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 vert the, the triangular camera view into vertical optical path, which allows us to observe all these arenas uh, without any parallax and without shadows. So that we get a really clean image here, the over on the video image ready for image processing, and here's some control equipment that allows us to to fine tune the the, uh, the the ventilation in the chamber to stabilize the temperature as well as the light from underneath and above. And this is the camera going up and down. Now, this is the system that is has eventually been produced. Uh, and became a collaboration, uh, 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 or it has always been a collaboration of Wageningen University and the Knowledge Information Technology Company. So all the experiments were done by Wageningen University, uh, by the group of Martin Jongsma in Wageningen Plant Research. Actually, it's not the university, but Wageningen Plant Research, the, the contract research uh, a part of Wageningen UR. Uh, my company is the software developer. So we developed the software for computer vision, data acquisition, but then uh, Wageningen the University developed software for post-processing to combine or to integrate the, the readouts from the insect behavior with uh, the genetic knowledge the, uh, of the plant, the plant reading, the QTL analysis. Um, and what you're seeing here is just one, uh, one applic one uh, say, setup that can be created in, inside the Entolab. Because since then, we also uh, diverged in a uh, diverge in a different direction, is going from, from feeding behavior, from taste to olfaction, from smell. Meaning that, and then we are um, uh, approaching or addressing a, a different aspect of the plant resistant, which is the, the plant, say, the attractiveness or the repellence of plant odors or including defense mechanisms. And for that, traditionally, white tube old photometers are used. It's a very old technique in which an insect is released here and walks up uh, upstream and it can go left or right into uh, wind streams that are sent into the tube from uh, the, through an odor so air source over a flow meter over an odor source into the tube. And then two com sources can be, can be compared. Now, this is also a really a low throughput technique. Only one insect can be tested at a time. And we thought, how can this be automated and the throughput increased? And that was, uh, is possible by creating a device with 15 parallel channels, again, T-tubes. Um, uh, and that became a T-tube olfactometer. So a T-tube of Tomlin, multi, multiple T-tubes. Each one of them is one choice setup um, in which an insect is released in the center and can go left, can go left or right. Here you see it up or down. It can go in either direction. Here's a diagram in which the odors, one odor source is pushed into this air compartment. Another odor source is pushed into this air compartment and the air is sucked away through the outlet. So each one of these horizontal bars is an olfactometer, a, a two choice olfactometer. Um, and that is now being validated on a variety of animal uh, plant species and insect plant insect combinations. And this unit fits nicely inside the entolab chamber. So whereby camera light and uh, the whole form factor uh, and uh, isolation and temperature controls all taken care of. Um, as I told you, the, the, we, we have divided the work between Wageningen University and my company. Uh, my company makes the EtherVision software, that is the video tracking system, and the Wageningen University team makes the Etho analysis software, that is specialized software for plant breeding analysis. Uh, so 
their software looks like this. So it's, it's an add-on to the EtherVision and together it makes the Entolab solution. Now wrapping up, if we compare the different uh, the approaches, um, we have found out that the video tracking is really comparative in quality to testing whole plants or detached leaves. And in the end, leads to a 90% reduction in time and cost of the screening. So that way, uh, the people can do about 50 genotypes per person per day, and we can load 10 genotypes on a single plate um, going for, for 200. This is, these are data from the 200, so now we are at 300. We can make it even faster. Um, and this is... Uh, used in projects with a variety of partners from the plant breeding sector in which we validate the system for different insect species and plant uh, species. And these are the ones that have been validated. We have done research on caterpillars as well as plant hoppers. Uh, and those studies have not been completed yet. But so the number of insect species is growing and uh, mostly vegetables and ornamental plants but we're also working on field crops like maize and uh, wheat. And we would love to do this uh, together with the CIMIT to make this technology available for the, say the crops that you're working on to contribute to the development of resistant varieties of maize and wheat serving the needs of farmers in all the countries where that you are uh, targeting. Um, and I uh, hope that uh, I've uh, the, um, conveyed uh, uh, convincingly that video technology, computer vision, and pattern recognition, which are AI techniques, uh, allow automated high throughput screening of plant for resistance in the examples that I showed for sucking insects. Uh, the other, other species await final validation and publication. The, this leads to reduction in time and cost. It greatly re reduces dependency on chemical pesticides and contributes to more sustainable crop production. And this is really the result of a public-private effort uh, with a strong team at the Wageningen University Research. Uh, Martin Jongsma, actually, the, this, this slide was taken from a presentation in which Martin was the co-author so Martin Jungsma, who's actually the key person, is accidentally not mentioned on this slide, but he should be here as the, the senior group leader. Um, the same applies to Marcel Dieke, who's not mentioned here because he was also a co-author of my previous talk. So Marcel Dieke and Martin Jungsma are the Wageningen Plant Research and Wageningen University representatives. And then there's uh, my company, and then there are the plant breeding companies that have been sponsoring this research, the, the first generation and new companies like BASEF are joining the team and Enza Zaden. Um, and I hope we will extend this partnership to CG, to CIMIT and hopefully other CGIAR Institute. And this ends my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I will now stop the sharing, sharing and of the screen and I'm happy to answer any questions. And, if you would like to speak to my staff at some point in other languages, we have a Spanish speaking office that uh, works in Mexico, headquartered in Santiago de Chile, and most other countries are served from the Netherlands or from the branch offices in other countries. Thank you very much. Stop sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh, let's give a virtual clap to Lucas for that uh, excellent and fascinating presentation. Um, of his uh, work on the resistance to insect, especially on the phenotyping methodologies that uh, the company has developed uh, together with the public sector as well as the private sector partners. Uh, there Thank is, uh, uh, colleagues, please feel free to write down your questions uh, on the chat box. Uh, Lucas, there is one question uh, from a colleague, Abdul Rahman Issa from Nepal. Uh, thanks, Lucas. Do you foresee the possible adoption of this sensor or artificial intelligence technology by national programs uh, in countries where a CIMIT operates, like, for example, in Africa or in Asia or in Latin America? Uh, have you partnered with any national programs? Uh, in no, the not yet. So uh, the, we, we, the one 
we uh, actually we launched the system last uh, last year commercially. So the, the six years before it was in the research and development phase. It was launched commercially after all these validation studies last year. Uh, the the first uh, customer outside Wageningen was actually the University of the Philippines, uh, mm -hmm. who are closely working together with the East West Seed Company. So their studies have started last year. Um, and, um, I'm not sure if CIMIT operates in the Philippines, but in any case, it is currently being used in the Philippines. Uh, there is a second system uh, traveling around as a trial system in, Ch in China, uh, mm -hmm. uh, managed by our office in Beijing. Uh, and we, at any time, we can, we can make another trial system available, which can travel uh, to any CIMIT location, because since it, the whole, everything is now housed in a compact chamber, it has become really travel proof. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the much way easier than before when it was a, a large collection of loose components. Mm -hmm. And also the, the, say the setting up the system with the camera illumination and arena placeholders are all ro robustly fixed, uh, cannot really go wrong. So okay. we've just, uh, the, due to COVID, we've had to support these remote trials uh, through video connections. We have done that all remotely uh, mm -hmm. and you are all used to that by now. So that works quite fine. Of course, we prefer to go on site. Um, and if, if scientists are unsure if it can work for their plant insect combination, then uh, with due import permission, we can run those trials in Wageningen for, to, for testing purposes, then mm -hmm. uh, provide uh, results and if the if the institute yes finds the result convincing, then the next step can be to send a trial unit to that institute. Oh, wonderful! That's usually the the three step approach. We we first receive material in the in Wageningen, if allowed, if there's no uh, blocking of the insect or plant species uh, due to uh, the border regulations. Second, if that works fine, a trial placement. And third, a real project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the second question is, is uh, uh, from Mainasara from Zimbabwe. Have you experienced uh, behavioral changes when uh, conditions change like temperature or humidity, uh, especially when you use the video tracking system? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So uh, the temperature is the most well-known, well the ambient factor that influences uh, just about anything you can measure in a video tracking system. Uh, start, starting with the, the movement, the, say the activity level of the insect being a cold-blooded organism and the movement speed, that translates to, to distance travel to the, the time spent moving and also translates to difference in the movement patterns. So that's why the temperature control is a very important factor in doing this type of experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, either uh, we've, we've built that, uh, we made that part of the system with the automated ventilation control but then usually the whole the antelope unit is placed in a in a climate controlled room um, mm -hmm. because the the system cannot immediately or uh, cannot automatically deal with all temperature changes same applies to okay. humidity that should also be standardized because it has an effect on locomotion and all derived parameters mm -hmm. uh, two but more it's an interesting questions. factor and then also yeah. in the breeding programs but then we are talking about breeding of beneficial insects there, researchers are interested in if the insect is able to deal with um, the, the environment, the climate in which it has to perform as a natural enemy. That's a different application, but that's mm -hmm. also a topic of study uh, with, the, with the same system, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you track one insect at a time? That is James Getty's question. Um, we, uh, we uh, track uh, but, but you have shown multiple insects can be tracked in your video Absolutely. presentation. So we, we yeah. track, uh, the, yeah. the typical application is we track one insect per arena, but the, mm. the whole, the high throughput aspect of the system is yeah. that we can build up to 300 arenas on the one video camera. So yeah. you typically, the scientist has a couple, at least two of these uh, release units. And while mm. one unit is, be, is sitting inside the antelope chamber, the next unit is being filled with insects. Uh, mm -hmm. And for that, we have special methods, the, allowing the technician to rapidly 
place one insect from a, uh, a breeding vial into okay. the leash compartment ready for the next test run. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Chivasa from Kenya is asking, does the technology work with non-sucking pests, for example, yes. uh, lepidopter and pests uh, Absolutely. that so, chew the, the whole leaf? Yeah, so the, 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 well, well, the system was, was, say, conceived for the sucking insects, the, the questions from non-sucking insects came rapidly. Uh, we've now uh, had a study, we performed studies with caterpillars. Uh, we've studied with the plant hoppers uh, and, uh, and thrips also sort of scrape the surface of the leaf. So insects that eat from the leaf, scrape the surface, chew the leaf. Um, the yes, also, also works fine. The, um, we, have, we have fewer studies completed but those are, have been completed or are being published. So with the, the evidence base is growing and uh, mm -hmm. say the portfolio of insect plant combinations is also growing. Yeah, for example, uh, we are quite interested in understanding the mechanisms behind resistance to, for example, Falami worm, uh, which is a typical lepidopter and, and pest, which is attracting a lot of concern all across the world. Uh, so definitely that is one important avenue for collaboration that we see because we have excellent set of resistant lines, susceptible lines. We are undertaking some metabolomic analysis in collaboration with uh, uh, IRD in, in France, uh, but would like to understand more about uh, the insect behavior on resistant versus susceptible genotypes and uh, what factors are responsible for the yeah. same, okay. Uh, the question from another question related to what James has asked is that, do the insects behave differently uh, when there are many uh, in the same arena or uh, yes. will they behave same? Yes, the, the, so this is a, uh, always a fun, fundamental question for anybody studying insect behavior. Uh, yes, the presence of all insects in an arena influences the behavior of the others. Um, and so, the, especially when in, in choice tests, uh, certain insect species tend to follow each other. So if one makes a choice and the other, fo other follows and it may be following more the insect rather than the, the, the plant odor. Or the, so in order to get a true uh, replica of your experiment, they have to be tested one per arena. And that is a sort of a golden rule in uh, all choice studies with uh, in insect behavioral choice studies both with, with eating and with uh, olfaction. Of course, um, you have, you, by studying one insect per arena, you have less throughput, but by, through this new multi, multiple arena technique, that, uh, that, this, that drawback is taken away, and you keep mm -hmm. the statistical say, the advantage of every trial being a true replicate of, the, of, the, of your test. Mm -hmm. So one question I have here, for example, is that uh, uh, the behavior of genotypes could change uh, when you test the whole plant sometimes versus leaf disc methods, uh, especially for an insect like Falami worm, where on the whole plant, they have a capacity to respond and uh, recover from yes. the damage compared to a leaf disc or a, even an intact leaf. So yep. how do you how do you reconcile this this capacity for recovery versus uh, a, a behavior on on a leaf disc or an intact leaf? Yeah. So the the the, the leaf discs have now more or less been uh, really replaced by intact leaves or large leaf strips. So uh, the, the the current users are all using either complete intact leaves or leaf strips. Uh, not the simple small leaf disc in order to uh, retain the terhor of the leaf and um, of course that that leaf that leaf is not attached to a plant uh, we, we so in the in some of the slides of my presentation you, you saw comparisons between a complete plant a detached leaf or a leaf disc and mm -hmm. the, the detached intact leaf comes very close to the intact plant but of course it also depends on the duration of the test the number of mm -hmm. days so the one the option we have not tested yet, but which could be tested with the, the envelope chamber is to, uh, to place a, uh, uh, a complete plant under the chamber and uh, remove the bottom 
and have the stem and the leaf connected and play bring the leaf into the assay plate holder um, attached to the plant. So that's an experiment that still has to take place. And we are curious about the outcome. But the, okay. the, the, the differences between the intact leaf and the leaf to a plant are so little that so far the, our users have been happy with testing in complete leaves on, a, on an arena. I see. OK. But it could change between uh, insect species. Yes, uh, I, I fully agree. So <laughs> We haven't, we haven't uh, by far covered the whole insect kingdom yet. I mean, right. we've only had a few dozens of species. Yes. So one more question. Is it possible to track OV position preference as well using the system? OV position preference. Um, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting one. Because for, of course, for, um, and then you are ta talking about OV position of a, of a herbivore on the leaf. I assume that's what you're, you're not talking about yeah. a natural enemy into an insect. No, no, enemy. not natural so, enemy, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. well, we haven't done it yet, but well, I know that our, say, pattern recognition techniques have become so powerful that I quite I find it quite, uh, I dare to assume that we can uh, visually discriminate between the opposition posture and the feeding posture and the probing posture. So uh, I think that should be possible. If the, if the, the, if the egg of the insect is uh, size-wise uh, not too similar to the insect itself, the, uh, which is usually the case, the egg is much smaller than the, the female insect, then uh, there should be no risk of visual confusion. So mm -hmm. I would love to do the experiment. Okay, and Simon if, is asking uh, whether have you, this system can be used to test other materials because mostly your presentation focused on leaves, but can it also be used to test, uh, for example, grains or roots or other materials? Um, right, now, if say, if you want to test repellents, then you're talking about an olfactory effect. In that case, so the olfactometer module is more sensible, more meaningful than the arena in which the animal is placed on the surface of the object to be tested. So when it comes to uh, grains, roots, and leaves, where you want to test the effect of the repellent, of uh, repellent effect on the choice behavior of the insect, yes, then simply that source is placed in a glass vial that is connected to the multi-tube olfactometer. And then mm -hmm. you can run 15 trials in parallel, testing the repellent effect of the substance. So the yes. answer is yes. Okay. There's, there's no limit Fine. to the type of material that can be tested in the olfactory testing. Only in the mm -hmm. feeding and probing, there the, the, the structure of the material is, is relevant because that needs to fit in those arenas. So mm -hmm. for instance, with eggplants, eggplants are round. We, we, we ended up cutting little one by one centimeter blocks of eggplant and placed those in the arenas so that we could make an array of eggplant, eggplant uh, pieces on which the animal insects could be released. And then it worked in the interlop system. So we are very creative or the, the, our Wageningen University colleagues are even much more creative in finding the design solution for different uh, insect plant combinations or other uh, objects, plant parts like fruits, roots, stems, and the like. Um, Dr. Prasanna? It seems I... that his image has frozen. Yes, but... uh, we can, I think we can, uh, while he connects again, maybe we can uh, follow up on the following question. Sure, sure. Uh, what so... is the repeatability, repeatability observed when sample of same leaf replicated against another leaf uh, from same plant? That is the first question. And the second one is, does algorithm take into account physical variation on leaves such as uh, trichomes, uh, waxiness, and so forth? Yeah, now that's a good one. Um, the second one is much easier for me to answer than the first one. So I'll do the second one first. The, the algorithm, 
uh, say the, 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 the probing and feeding recognition algorithm is, um, is trained for every plant species, plant insect combination. Uh, indeed, because trichomes, waxiness, honeydew, uh, physical structure, stickiness have a, have a strong impact on the walking behavior or the walking ability of the insect on the plant. So um, we, we train our algorithm for every new combination. So there's not one, um, one size fits all. The, the, the algorithm is trainable for different plant species. Uh, and then it takes into account the, the physical properties, the morphological properties. The first question, the, uh, the level of heritability, repeatability with plants from the same, uh, leaves from the same plant. Yes, that's, that is less. How much less? What level? I don't know because really I'm not a plant breeding or expert or a plant geneticist. So that I should ask my colleague Martin Jungsma, who will be happy to answer that question. And if um, I will be happy to send answers to Isabel to be distributed to the, the, the those who ask the questions after this meeting. Sure. Thanks a lot, uh, Lucas. And uh... Uh, I don't see any further questions, but uh, this is indeed a very fascinating presentation, opens up uh, exciting possibilities of collaboration, um, not only for the mandate crops of maize, uh, of cement, uh, including maize, wheat, and other cereals uh, uh, on which we are working on, but also under the broader one CGIR plant health initiative, I'm sure there'll be many colleagues outside CIMIT to who will right. be interested in collaboration. Yes. So uh, we look forward to a more stronger interface with you, Lucas, uh, uh, in the months and years to come. And uh, definitely there are exciting opportunities uh, to yes. work together. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a really great pleasure that, to give this presentation and to answer the, the many interested questions. There is a few questions in the chat box that I have not answered yet. But if time is up for this seminar, then we should stop. In that case, I'll be happy to answer them by email. Uh, sure. If you want me to answer them now, that's possible too. So you, you decide. Uh, anything, uh, I think we have, you have answered most of the questions, uh, well, except, sure. yeah, except maybe, yeah, leaf damage is not always correlated with final grain yield. This relates to what I asked too, in terms well, of- uh, there's, I see yeah. here one. Uh, do you have any issues when the leaves are moving with the wind while capturing data? Ah, okay. Well, uh -huh. that that problem cannot occur because the leaves are fixated in the in the arenas in the placeholders inside the entolab cabinet. Mm -hmm. So that is that that problem does not occur. Uh, there's a question: Can it be tested with pest resistance of weevils and maize? Yes, yeah, sure. That is an option. We should we should do that. And I saw a question. Here, leaf what happens if you place yeah resistant yeah. leaf and another leaf susceptible on the same arena? Well, we, we we to accommodate that question, we've made the the two choice option in which mm -hmm. the the two varieties are the separated by the release tube. So the the insect can choose between the resistant and the susceptible. Those are not in the same plate. However, they could. I mean, you could. You could make uh, half circular leaf discs and place those in one arena. You're free to do that. We have mm -hmm. not done that. We've made a choice with a, a, a T tube. Okay. And then there was one there question. Another question Suresh is asking about nutrition effects on, on feeding behavior and other things. As, so that, that's another variable, but I don't know whether you tested that. Uh, let me. What was the question? What was that question? Let me see. Insect behavior in relation to plant nutrition regimes. Last um, one. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Um, <laughs> do you expect a plant? Mm, okay. no, when there is plant nutrition status changes or plant growth, yep. especially. Well, you know, yeah. um, if say if you are in the plant nutrition business, I I would you could you could make this a topic of your study. Of course, you could you could subject your plants to say different uh, 
different treatments or different feeding treatments and then compare plants from different feeding treatments in the antelope system. That's certainly possible. And if yeah. you're not in that business, then I would standardize the, the nutrition regime uh, to make sure that that's not a confounding factor in your study. The right. design. Right. So my final question to you, Lucas, is uh, the Entolab system, uh, how accessible it is, uh, if you can provide us with some details uh, on that, like, for example, what's the cost of an Entolab system? Uh, yeah, that we, if, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that, that's, that's a, that depends on the insect plan combination, but because that determines which types of plates are included. Mm -hmm. It also depends mm -hmm. whether you go for olfaction studies or feeding studies feeding behavior. okay um uh, or whether you want to be able to do all of that mm -hmm. uh, the, some some groups want to have the cabinet alone others want to have the cabinet mounted on a on a cart with all the other equipment so that it can be rolled from one laboratory to the others mm -hmm. i i can ask a colleague of mine to provide that information because i'm excellent that's, excellent that's not my speciality okay thanks a I'm lot yeah, once again, uh, friends, let's uh, open up our videos and uh, give a big hand to Lucas for this excellent presentation. Uh, very fascinating topic and very relevant to the work that we are doing. So many thanks, Lucas. Uh, Thank you very much for your interest. Here at CIMIT and from uh, colleagues in uh, other CG centers who are part of this uh, meeting. So once again, uh, heartfelt gratitude to you for sparing your time, for coming to Simit and for uh, giving this talk. And Isabel, uh, thanks a lot for organizing this. Yes, uh, Bram yeah, and Martin for, and yeah, hospitality. <laughs> thanks for the coordination. It proved very tough to fix the date, but finally we did it. <laughs> it worked, it worked out. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas, and uh, look forward to uh, further discussing with you. And I'll send okay. you a copy of a PDF copy of my slides for distribution if you wish. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Take bye care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.